Anybody have any questions? Any kind of question? Yeah. Um, a few weeks ago, you mentioned to me. A few weeks ago, you mentioned to me a story about this guy you knew from Switzerland who could take his consciousness to oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And now, I was wondering if you could expand on this uh, very interesting sounding story. This is this is very interesting. If you've suddenly been bored recently. You know, we're halfway through the retreat, and actually once I heard there was a Chinese saying, if you have a, a journey of a hundred miles, consider 90 miles halfway. So I, I recommend that. Uh, and then we can still keep enthusiastically uh, putting our energy into each moment. But um, this is an interesting story. Uh, and it, it's, uh, um, uh, you know, Sung San Sinim, uh, we know, and maybe you've read the story, he did this outrageous, very difficult, very strong retreat when he was a very young man, and he had a great uh, purpose and direction and, and a great motivation, and he actually got enlightened. Um, but afterwards, he ate food too quickly compared to his diet, and he told us once his whole body swelled up, and he said any place you pushed his body, like this yellow liquid would come out, and he almost died, and he said he was saved by one old monk who burned little bits of moxibustion on his tanjan about a hundred pieces a day for about two months, and then slowly he could eat, he said this, a walnut juke, you know, ju uh, a very thin porridge made from rice and walnuts. And either then or during the Korean War, he got diabetes. And diabetes really wears away at many different parts of your body. So he always had a kind of, even though he was tremendously strong physically and definitely mentally, and very, uh, you know, uh, really, his vow was probably the most amazing thing, so he wouldn't stop. Anyway, but Sung San Sinim was like that. And as he'd travel around, uh, students would find out, oh, he has this strong diabetes, and they'd make many suggestions to him. And I don't know if you're sick and you have lots of people telling you, oh, you know, you should do this, you should do this. It can get to be pretty annoying. And um, he used to, uh, he had two ways I saw of dealing with it. If people sort of got pushy, he'd say, I understand my body. And then most people would back off. You know, oh, sir, diabetes, you need to eat this and this, and you should sleep more, and you need to take vacations. You know, whatever their idea was. You have to go out and run every day. And, you know, everybody had some idea. Um, if the person didn't back off and kept pushing, finally he'd say, my sickness saves all beings. And I thought, and then everybody would drop it then, <laughs> you know, they would stop pushing. It's like, my sickness saves all beings. So this story is about this very interesting man. I think this is around 1987. He was an engineer from Switzerland. And he was in his 50s then. And he told me that when he was a child, he had taken a metal fork and he had put it into an electrical socket. You know, kids do that stuff. It's like, oh, this should be interesting. <laughs> and he got an electric shock that threw him across the room when he was a little kid, like three or four. And he said, but I realized at that moment, the whole universe is energy. This is just another form of energy, you know. So he got something, but he, you know, he, he had no idea what to make of that. But he sort of went through school kind of like, it's all energy, you know. <laughs> and he became an engineer. And then as an adult, he started to become more interested in it. And at some point, he went to the Philippines. And you know, there's these people in the Philippines that can do surgery on your body without cutting. Somehow they go into your body and they fix something. So one day, um, 
He went up to Sansanin in our Paris Zen Center. He said, sir, you know, you have this diabetes and I know this technique where I can go into your body and the, the diabetes comes from a problem with the pancreas. And he said, I can find your pancreas and fix it. And Sansini was like, uh, that's okay, that's okay. <laughs> you know? And he said, no, no, really, I, I, I studied this, I can do it, and you know, I can, I can fix it. And then Sansini said, I understand my body. And then he said, yes, yeah, sir, but of course, of course you do, but you're really a great person. And if you didn't have diabetes, you could even teach more people. And then Sansini pulled out his, the final statement, my sickness saves all beings. So he's like, okay, you know, he sort of backs off. Then anyway, at the Paris Zen Center, the meditation room was long and thin, kind of like if the altar was there rather than here. And uh, it was a much smaller room, but a lot of people would come. So instead of the teacher sitting sort of at the back of the room, we sat in lines in front of the Buddha. So Sung San Sini would be, like if we were in lines here, he would sit right here, you know, uh, facing the Buddha. And I was the abbot, so I'd sit there, and there was another teacher there, and she would sit here, and it would go like that. And when Roland came, he always liked to sit in the second row directly behind Sung San Sini. So that night, after chanting and meditation was over, and Sansini had gone to his room, and people were hanging around and talking and stuff, and he said, you know, when I do this uh, special healing, I always ask permission before I go into somebody's body. And I didn't ask Sansini, but I think he's such a great man. During meditation, I thought, I should just go in there and fix it, you know? It's like, I don't need to ask him. This is a little special case. So he said, so during meditation, my consciousness came out and I went into his body and I was like hunting around, where's the pancreas? And then I found the pancreas and I went in. But when I went in, there was this gold light and Sansini was sitting like a little Buddha doing meditation inside the pancreas. So I just bowed and thought, okay. And I went out, you know, yeah, I guess your, your sickness really saves all beings. <laughs> okay, that's the, uh, uh, the Buddha in the pancreas story. <laughs> My sickness saves all beings. What do, you, what do you think about praying? What do I think about praying? Praying. Who are you praying to? Don't you don't pray or you don't know or what? Yeah, sometimes, I mean, it's like when I was a child, I sometimes pray for like Kwanzaa or something. That's not bad. You know, the two kinds of praying. Praying, uh, one kind is I want something. You know, like uh, Santa Claus uh, for Christmas, I'd like that kind of praying. Uh, but it might be Buddha, you know, or God or something. The other kind of prayer, correct prayer means become one. You and something become one. So uh, that's why uh, we, uh, in our practice, we still have chanting. A chanting is become one. Uh, be, you're chanting Kwan Sin Bolsa, you become one with Kwan Sin Bolsa. Or you become one with Ji Jang Bolsa, you become one with the sound. And that's actually correct p prayer. You know, for a Christian, they become one with God, which means uh, cut their thinking. Then automatically become one. That's correct. And sometimes prayer, actually somebody in the uh, afternoon uh, Zoom meditation class today asked me she, uh, about that. She said her brother died a couple months ago and he was a Buddhist, but he, he, he wasn't so sincere and he didn't really have great faith in Buddhism or, or any kind of practice. And she's wondering about uh, doing uh, chanting for him now. And, uh, you know, our practice is, you know, only don't know. Um, so I said, of course, of course, it's good to do. Um, uh, 
It's kind of like when you get in your car, you set the GPS, okay? You want to go to some place in Seoul, and you set the GPS, and then you go. But along the way, if you keep, oh, no, wait, uh, I'm going to set it again, and you keep resetting it for the same place, it's really stupid. The same thing, okay, I'm praying, I want to chant for my brother. Okay, it's already clear. You don't need to think about it again. Just chant. Just do it. Your energy and the chanting energy become one. Uh, that's the important thing. So, Sung San Sini once gave a talk at uh, Hua Gesa to Koreans, and later uh, he or somebody translated for us. And uh, you might have heard this before. He said, You come to the temple and you put a thousand won on the altar. You know, it's about one American dollar. And you ask Buddha, make my husband rich, and my son get into good university, and my daughter find a good husband. How would you feel if somebody gave you Chun Wan and asked for all of that? <laughs> he said, let's get rid of that kind of Buddhism. When you're chanting, just chant. When you're bowing, just bow. When you're doing something, just do it. That time you and the whole universe become one. That's a correct way to help yourself, help your family, help this world. So same thing, just do it, you know. Yeah. Um, one more thing about that, which I talked to the lady today on the Zoom is, um, uh, we say everybody's consciousness is like a TV station sending and receiving signals. And people who have close karma are like tuned to the same channel. So when you're practicing and your mind becomes more clear, automatically goes to the people you have a close karma with. And it's possible they may also become more clear. And since mind is unhindered by time, space, life, death, then your efforts, your, your effort uh, for someone chanting, say, even after they die, will help them. And not only that, uh, some years ago there was a, a big uh, Korean airline plane crash in Guam, and almost everybody died. And it was, a mis it was a mistake by the pilot, even. And I remember reading about it, and um, there were a lot of families on the plane, vacationing, there were a lot of newlyweds taking their honeymoon, and it really bothered me. And um, uh, very close, like a day or two later, after this happened, uh, I was traveling with uh, Desan Sanin to Hong Kong. And uh, on the flight, at one point I said, sir, can I ask you a question? And he said, yeah. And I said, I can't stop thinking about these people who were on this plane, what can I do? And he said, you must do uh, seven day Jidang Bosok Kido. Yes, sometimes out loud when you're alone, but all the time uh, silently, like when we're eating, when we're doing something, like mantra, he said, all the time, Jidang Bosok, Jidang Bosok. And then he said, that will help you, that will help them. So that struck me. It wasn't just that will help them, that will help you, that will help them. When this mind, all this, you're connected to somebody, you're aware of some loss or something, uh, or something's incomplete, make your mind whole, return to whole, and then the natural way appears. You know, many times uh, what we want isn't the natural way, and many times we may get something we don't want, but it may be exactly what helps us the most, and we may end up very happy, you know. It's very important. Uh, he said two kinds of sanim, feeling sanim and correct sanim. Feeling sanim has a feeling. I like living in the temple. I want a peaceful life. Or, oh, I had some bad experiences in lay life and I don't want it anymore. Um, this kind of thing. And he said, but any feeling changes and situations change, and your condition changes. If you become a sanim because of some feeling, some, you know, then uh, when things change, you'll lose your direction, and it'll be a problem. 
said, Corexanim perceives this world, perceives my job, then becomes a Sanim. That is, will not be hindered by anything. You know, you can imagine, you become a Sanim and you're sick, 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 and, and then you're wondering, why should I do this? Maybe if I was a lay person again, I'd get healthy and stuff like that. Um, that's it, being attached to your condition. If your original purpose is clear, then this is no problem. Um, but you have to be clear and be able to do it. You know, for example, if you're uh, from Buddhist time, if you're missing a limb, if you uh, are deaf, can't hear, if you're blind, he wouldn't ordain you. You can't ordain. If after you've been a Sanim a bunch of years and you become blind, no problem. You can stay. Okay, so uh, Buddha is very clear. It's not just for my benefit to have some, good, some situation that I want. It's for others. So you have to be able to do it, you know. But if you put yourself in a situation you don't want to be in, you're going to have a problem if you don't know yourself. Or one day you'll figure it out, or you'll never figure it out until the suffering is great enough that either you get a big question or you do something really stupid that makes it worse. So even something that can be big suffering, if we have practice mind later can be, wow, that helped me. I wouldn't have been here without that. It doesn't mean everybody should become a Sanim. It just means you have to understand yourself and your direction has to be clear. Then do it. You know, because impermanence, uh, suffering, non-self, it's the same for everybody. Only what circumstances are you willing to deal with it in? And uh, if that becomes clear, then... Uh, you know, I have a, a, a great brother who actually told me about yoga uh, first and uh, gave me my first Zen story. A younger brother does meditation. It's family life and, and working in the world really brings out his uh, great qualities. So uh, there's no one way. Well, there's only one way. Face my I, my me and uh, become clear it down. But the circumstances really uh, it depends on um, if we understand ourselves well, then we can do it. Everywhere you go, every way you go, there's all kinds of challenges. So uh, no one should think, oh, if I get this, I, I won't have challenges. Or if I get this, then I'll be happy. It's not like that. That's a, a, a change maybe in the students, okay? Uh, I noticed the first, uh, Sansanim changed around 1984. Before that in America, he was very directive with people. If you were living in the Zen Center three years and uh, still were single, he'd start pushing you to get married or pushing you to um, ordain. And if you got married, so <laughs> sometimes he'd say, soon make baby. <laughs> he felt like two people married uh, without a baby just becomes a, a stronger I, my, me. You know, baby will screw that up for sure <laughs> and give you big don't know mind. <laughs> or you'll do something to those kids and they'll that karma will come right back at you big time when they're teenagers, right? Or even the rest of their life. But around 84, he stopped doing that. I think he saw uh, the, you know, in, we say, uh, Lin Chi says, our school has no doctrine. I simply untie knots, okay? He just perceives where uh, somebody's stuck and uh, touches it, you know? freeze it, 
gives you the opportunity to free it. And in the same way, um, my experience is the medicine, the, the teaching appears really in a way from the student. The student creates the teaching. Uh, if, the, if the teacher's clear, it just pops up because of what's presented. So fix your body, shave your head, shave your beard, and uh, uh, become a hangwan and a hangja, and then a monk. Okay, chew on that for a while. Quantum <laughs> uh, Other questions? Or only go straight, don't know. <laughs> you, what? What's that? Can I have a baby? No. <laughs> Get married and ask your wife. <laughs> it's better to do it together. <laughs> If you ask me, no. <laughs> you know, one time during a kyolche at Shinwinsa, uh, a young man and his girlfriend, uh, who had lived a little while in our Zen Center in Los Angeles, came, and uh, they both sat the retreat. And I remember it, Sung Santini would only come down to the kyolche three times. Uh, and we'd only have one or two or no interviews with him. We'd have interviews from the Jito Popsa who stayed there. Um, he would give a talk at the very beginning. He'd come down, often he wasn't even in Korea uh, for a month or two, he'd be traveling someplace. Uh, he usually would come down in the middle and he'd come down at the end, the last day. And um, we'd have Dharma talk with him and he'd answer questions. And sometimes he'd also come a day earlier and give everybody interviews, but less and less as he got older. Um, but anyway, at this one, I knew these two and they're talking about getting married or not get married or something, you know, and this guy wasn't so, he hadn't really made up his mind, he wasn't clear. And uh, during the question and answer, he asked Sung San Sanin, uh, Sir, um, should I get married or become a monk? And I don't know if San Sanin knew that his girlfriend was there. But he said, why ask me? Next question. And I thought, I don't know if you knew that. That was brilliant. <laughs> you know, don't touch that. You know, why ask me? You know, that's between them. You know? And you know, any therapist says, don't get in between the patient and their mother. You know, well, it's, it doesn't only mean mother, but, you know, don't get in between these two people who are trying to decide something. Yeah. So uh, that first time when I went in, I was, you know, 27, I think, and actually I remember clearly, Sunsini was cutting his nails, and I knocked on his door, and I said, sir, can I talk to you? And he said, oh, come in, come in. He put everything aside. Oh, what do you want? And I said, can I become a monk? And he said, why? And I said, why not? And they said, no, 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 why is very important. And he told me this uh, uh, feeling sinim and correct sinim and so forth. So I realized I, I wasn't clear about it. And so I said, what should I do? And he made, years later I realized he simply was totally like a mirror, perfect reflect where I was at, he said, you follow Georgie and Mubulsani. And I realized he picked the strongest practicing male in the Zen Center who happened to be married and had kids and the one American monk who was in the Zen Center. And he told me to follow them. <laughs> and when he said that, I realized I'm going to have to figure this out myself. <laughs> you know, he's not going to say this way or that way. He, he reflected my mind. I don't know this. I wasn't thinking, should I do this or should I do that? I wasn't even thinking about it. I just got this feeling after a year, you know, or this idea, I guess, I want to be a monk. And, um, but he just like reflected it, okay? So, <laughs> But he, uh, you know, 
uh, understood how to, uh, when and how to push people. And at a certain point he saw, people aren't so open to being pushed anymore. And uh, so he uh, used a different way, you know. But some people he would, you know, it's dependent on the person. And many people like me, he a little bit put a roadblock up. If I had answered differently to why, then he might say, oh, okay, very good. You, you become Hangja, and then after one year we check, you know, something like that. But he, he saw, and uh, he just met that very clearly. And it took longer for me. I needed to digest something. And I think he was right. If he had made me a monk just excited, like, oh, another Western monk, it would have been a problem a couple years later. It's better I got the problem out first. In my case, in my case, everybody, we don't know how we're going to learn what will be helpful. So that's why we only go straight, don't know. And like Bob Hasten said, try, try, try. So anybody have another question? Okay, uh, you have a question. Um, I'm wondering in, uh, in other Buddhist traditions like Theravada and uh, Tibetan, so they kind of, meditation, they have like a lot of different techniques which they use and you also build up, like if you start shamatha and just the breath and then the body and then maybe like mimita and jhanas and all kind of stuff. And, uh, but kind of in our style, you just show up on the first day, they tell you Pansa Bosa or what am I? And, just keep on doing that till the day you die. Right. So I'm kind of wondering why, you know, how come other traditions have different kind of stuff when we just use this one thing, keep on with it, and we don't have any buildup of kinds of meditation or something. Yeah. Uh, people have different karma. So Buddha also gave di different kinds of teaching to people. Uh, sometimes we say Theravadan Buddhism is like uh, riding a bicycle. You know, you, you follow the teachings, get on the bicycle, and you save yourself. Uh, Mahayana is like uh, driving a bus. You, you have a way of going, and you invite a whole lot of people to get in the bus with you, and you all get saved. And uh, Zen is more like a rocket or a missile. There's no road. Just boom, go to the end right there. So yeah, that's Zen style. And it doesn't, it's, it's, it's uh, for some people, that's not what's going to benefit them. You know, so everybody has to figure it out. Yeah. If you're already doing it, don't check. And then the next step will appear. Yeah. So uh, yeah, people say, how come, you know, there's no stages and there's no this and, and yeah, Tibetan Buddhism, you know, even the preliminary teachings are bowing, uh, mantra, visualization, and uh, offerings to the guru, you know, the, the, the developing of devotion and appreciation and gratitude. And Zen is, uh, you know, who are you? <laughs> so, uh, and it's not necessarily one's faster or one's slower. It's what way do you decide to try, you know? I mean, a jet plane is the fastest way to Pusan. Uh, but if you don't know how to fly it, it's not going to be the fastest way. <laughs> Walking might be faster, you know? <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, uh, the fastest way, if you don't know how to fly a jet, is not getting in a jet and trying to fly it. <laughs> So each person has to find uh, their way. Even Buddhas, when he was dying, he said something like, um, uh, do good, don't do harm, and be a lamp unto yourself. In other words, uh, uh, be the light, you know, which basically meant you must find your way and, and save yourself. Of course, saving ourselves by ourselves is almost impossible. Maybe Buddha could do that. Even Sung San Sin, you know, learned from the tradition and then went and did it. And uh, that's also our job. But there's so many ways to do it. And, one, and 
perhaps the best way is living together, practicing together. But some people's situation, it's better if they come to a retreat, learn how to practice, and then do it in their life situation. Yeah, so each of us, and, and you don't know. I mean, I was, you know, I must have been like somebody who ran into a shop and broke a lot of stuff trying to figure out what I was going to do. And then I had to go back and clean it up. <laughs> okay. Uh, one quick thing. I suggest people not talk about kongans with each other. You know, it's tempting to, but actually the treasure of a kongan is uh, not knowing. And uh, Sun Santini was always great at giving teaching that helped our direction. That's why we mostly say, during retreat, don't read anything except Sung Santini. It's not that that's the only teaching, but it's all applicable to how to do it. And even if you're stuck on some kongan, then you can ask the teacher, and maybe they'll give you some direction with it. You know, what am I doing right now? That's the best way to practice kongan. You know, you don't even need to think of them at all. Um, if it pops up on its own, hmm. But otherwise, Sung San Sinim always said, our style of Kong An practice is moment to moment clear mind. When you're doing something, just do it. So that's what helps. And uh, if a particular Kong An is kind of itchy, you know, it'll come up once in a while and just take a look at it. Whether you get an answer or not, just put it aside and return. My experience, which actually is kind of suffering, is, you know, sitting up here and you think of some kong on that you've been asked, and it's like, I got it, you know, and you're real excited, and then I go down and ask me this, and I and give my answer, no. <laughs> and I'm just like st stunned, you know? And so during the next week, I'm saying, ah, of course, now I got it, now I got it, you know, and go down to ask and give an F, no. And then one day you don't know and you don't even really care anymore, you know, but you're not really doing anything but just doing the next thing. And they ask you, you hit, give an answer, correct. And you're like, <laughs> you had that one time recently, yeah, it was like, Where'd that come from? But if you get too into that, eh, you know, don't even hold that. It's like, okay, that's cool. Now what? You know, that's important. Now what? So um, uh, there was, there's one woman in our Chamsan bond, and I had asked everybody at Kongan, and then the next week, I think she was sitting in one of these retreats a few years ago, and she came in and she said, ask me that Kongan from last week. So I asked her, and she got it correctly. And she jumped up, and she was bouncing around the room, so happy. And my first thought was, that's not going to last long. <laughs> And then, okay, time to give her, I gave her a new Kung An hit, she gives an answer, she's wrong, and she slams the book shut, and she stands up and she walks out really pissed off. And I knew that would happen because she was like so happy the, uh, getting it, that means she's probably going to be so unhappy when she doesn't get it. Enjoy it, and then just drop it. So, you know, I asked a lot of people this Kong on about how do you get the chicken out of the bottle without breaking the bottle. So, uh, I like that Kong on because when I got it, it was sudden and stuff. And, and it's kind of cool. I think it's a cool Kong on. And what happened is Sung San Tanim had gone to America in, uh, no, America, into to Europe the first time was 1978. And I think seven students with went with him, but I, I wasn't traveling with him those days. I, I was working every day outside. And uh, he came back and he had little presents for everybody. And I, I was doing something in the Zen Center office on, uh, this is the, the funeral parlor. <laughs> and um, uh, Santini came in and he brought this little glass bottle, toy 
glass bottle with the chicken inside and a, and a cork, you know, this kind of thing that sticks in top of a, um, somebody I mentioned cork, they didn't know what it was, uh, like a wine bottle, okay? And so he asked me the question, and I'm holding it, I go like this, and then I pull the cork off. And he goes, no, no, no. And he turns and goes away. And then I'm just looking at it and stuff, and then another answer appears. And he turns around, he says, correct! And he's happy, and I'm happy, and he turns to leave, and to myself I say, a little slow. And I suddenly feel, as he's walking away, he heard me checking, and he reached back and he whopped me on that back of the head like this, you know. And I thought, this guy is so moment to moment. I get the correct answer and he's all excited and the next moment I check and he whops me. <laughs> That's correct life and Kongan practice. <laughs> moment to moment. So you can be very happy and then what now? Okay, don't keep holding it. And uh, same thing with food. You know, when our, our retreats, we used to have no food outside of meal time, and sometimes the food wasn't even that good. No drinks either, just water. In the beginning, I don't know, we had some weird idea about, you know, you got to torture yourself a little bit. Um, but breakfast was my happiest moment of the day, you know, and I'd like mix all this stuff in with the porridge and everything. And I'd always take my time with the last spoonful. And like at lunch, I'd make sure the last thing I ate was something from the lunch that I liked. And you know what I found? Five minutes later, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, it's like, it doesn't matter what you ate last. It doesn't matter how much you loved it. It's gone. <laughs> now what? So uh, enjoy while you're doing it, and if you get an answer, enjoy. If you don't get an answer and you're pissed off, enjoy being pissed off for a moment, and then come back to now. Because even if we become Buddha, moment to moment, return to don't know, or we soon will have a problem, okay? So anyway, uh, have a great dinner, and the last thing that you eat, maybe it's like what, be sure it's the your favorite thing from the dinner, and then five minutes later, see what difference it makes. <laughs> anyway, all the meals have been really good, so thank you very much, kitchen master and kitchen staff, and uh, don't stop, okay? Keep making nice meals, please. Thank you. <laughs>